Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending what time zone you're in. Um, my name is Monette Zard. I'm the director of the program on forced migration and health at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event to mark the release today of a new knowledge brief on preventing and mitigating the indirect health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic with a focus on refugee and displaced populations in humanitarian settings. This event is being co-hosted with our friends at ICVA, the International Council of Voluntary Agencies, and we particularly uh, welcome our ICVA members to this discussion. Um, the knowledge brief that we're releasing today is the first in a series that examines the intersection of COVID-19, forced displacement, and health. These have been written by a research consortium, including ourselves here at the Program on Forced Migration and Health, the American University of Beirut, Brandeis University, Georgetown University, and Los Andes University in Colombia. Our consortium comes together as part of a, a bigger project, which is supported by the World Bank, UK Aid, and UNHCR. And the project aims to provide evidence and guidance to strengthen national health systems to address the needs of displaced and host populations in contexts of protracted displacement. Now, there is no question that the COVID-19 pandemic presents unprecedented challenges for health systems around the world, particularly in humanitarian settings. We know from past experiences with epidemics such as Ebola and H1N1 influenza that the toll taken by the pandemic itself is not just the deaths and illnesses that result from the disease itself, but that indirect health impacts exceed the deaths and illnesses which will be caused directly by COVID-19. And we know this because during a pandemic response, we've seen the diversion of resources, disruptions to medical supply chains, health facility closures, and healthcare worker uh, uh, shortages which often can overwhelm national health systems, particularly in humanitarian contexts. Restrictions on movement, legal status concerns, and fears of contagion can also sometimes reduce individuals' ability or willingness to travel to access healthcare. So our panel today will really, really reflect on how some of these indirect health impacts are making themselves felt during the current COVID-19 pandemic looking at some lessons learned from past epidemics and strategies to anticipate, prevent, and mitigate indirect health impacts on displaced populations. We have a distinguished panel today who will lead us through this discussion. Our first speaker is Professor Patrick Katcher, a public health physician with 30 years of experience in global health practice. For much of his career, Patrick was based at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention where he held leadership roles in the malaria branch and the Center for Global Health. His scholarship has focused on experimental and observational epidemiology and health system studies, examining the effectiveness and equity of malaria and child health interventions with an emphasis on real world research that shapes policies and programs. Patrick joined the faculty in 2018 and he coordinates implementation science partnerships with a focus on expanding access to quality primary health care services. And Patrick is the principal investigator on the World Bank project I described, and he will give us an overview of the knowledge brief itself. Our second speaker will be Professor Les Roberts, also a professor in the Department of Population and Family Health here at the Mailman School. Les was also based for a short while at the CDC, where he did a postdoctoral fellowship in epidemiology. In 1994, he worked as an epidemiologist for the World Health Organization in Rwanda during their civil war. Les was director of health policy at the International Rescue Committee uh, from 2000 to 2003. And he has led over 50 surveys in 17 countries, mostly measuring mortality in times of war. And in recent years, this has included surveys in Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, and Zimbabwe. He will give us some historical perspective on what we've learned from past outbreaks and how that might inform current responses. Our third speaker will be Ala Al-Tabawi. 
who is Acting Health Coordinator and Senior Health Program Manager, Manager for the IRC. Ala is a pharmacist by training and experienced program manager in the field of humanitarian assistance in emergencies. And for the past 10 years, she's been engaged in disaster response programs with a special focus on healthcare in emergency settings. She's managed several health projects working at different humanitarian organizations and UN agencies. And she has focused on primary healthcare, including uh, incommunicable and non communicable diseases, nutrition, projects focused on maternal, newborn, and child health. Her interests include continuity of quality humanitarian healthcare. And she will reflect on how the pandemic is playing out in Jordan with a specific focus on the health of refugee populations there. Our final speaker will be Mohammed Ahmad, who is the chair of the National Humanitarian Network in Pakistan, which is a network of 172 humanitarian organizations across the country. He's also the executive director of IDEA, which is the Initiative for Development and Empowerment Access, which works to assist marginalized and underserved communities in Pakistan, including refugees. Mohammed has been involved in the response to a variety of previous emergencies in Pakistan, including natural disasters, as well as conflict, and is an advocate of the localization of humanitarian action. He is on the advisory board of the UN Humanitarian Pool Fund in Pakistan, a member of the humanitarian country team, and a regular contributor to UN strategic policies and plans, amongst many other things. And he is a political scientist by training. So our speakers will each speak for between seven to 10 minutes to ensure that we have enough time for you, our audience, to engage in the Q&A. Please do type your questions in the Q&A. We have someone who will be monitoring that box. Um, and when you do so, please identify who you are and your institutional affiliation. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Patrick Katcher. Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, Monette. Can folks hear me well? And are you seeing my slides? The first slide describes what are indirect impacts. And Monette has already given us uh, uh, a taste of that, uh, emphasizing that in addition to the direct health impacts caused by infection with SARS-CoV-2 uh, and COVID-19 illness, the pandemic and our responses to it can have indirect health impacts on other conditions through disrupting fragile health systems already struggling to deliver basic services, through imposing mobility restrictions that affect patients, health workers, supplies, and even data, through the redeployment, illness, and loss of critical health workers, uh, commodities, and infrastructure, and through added economic challenges, fear, stigma, uh, misinformation and legal insecurity are all also ways by which indirect impacts can come about. And an overall increase in insecurity based on social, political, and economic upheaval can be consequential as well. Uh, as Monette noted, the indirect impacts can be as devastating and even exceed direct impacts in a pandemic or widespread health epidemic. In approaching this knowledge brief, we wanted to emphasize why humanitarian contexts are particularly vulnerable to indirect health impacts. We know that COVID-19 and our response to it has disrupted health services that are disproportionately, disproportionately utilized by displaced populations, and that displaced populations experience unique vulnerabilities and challenges in accessing healthcare. And these are often compounded by the, the necessities of the COVID-19 response and sometimes by the excesses of our response. And finally, the pandemic response disrupts people's own behavior in terms of the preventive 
and self-management of disease that they might do at home that might reduce their need to seek facility-based or formal health care. We undertook also to learn lessons from past epidemics, and I'm not going to dwell on this because Les Roberts is going to uh, share from his experience in a few minutes. In the box at the top, I, I singled out one detail that we noted in the report, and that was a study at the height of the Ebola crisis in West Africa, 57% of Liberian households reported that it was difficult or impossible for them to obtain needed health care. In past epidemics, disrupted health services have had consequences in terms of uh, specific services for family planning, childhood immunization, nutrition, malaria, mental health, chronic diseases and uh, infectious diseases that require continuity of care, such as tuberculosis and, and HIV. These disruptions in health services and uh, food insecurity have an outsized impact on maternal and child health. And this will occur even despite the potentially less severe direct impact that COVID-19 might have on younger populations. In one mathematical modeling study, it was suggested that COVID-19 related disruptions over a six month period alone could hit lower middle income countries with 12 to 57,000 additional maternal deaths and a quarter million to just over a million additional childhood deaths. But the situation and, and what we've learned from past epidemics is not entirely grim based on their experience confronting uh, recent epidemic uh, emergencies, many NGO partners and uh, ministries of health have recent or accessible experience with community engagement, public health and social measures, and case-based infection control practices We also wanted to draw attention to the specific COVID-19 impact in different contexts of displacement. And I included the box at the top of this slide, which is some recent data from August 2020, where the Africa CDC and other partners under the PERC collaboration in a nationwide poll ascertained that 62% of Liberians were currently reporting difficulty obtaining needed medicines. And I wanted to point that data point out along with the previous one during Ebola to make it clear that the extent of disruption from COVID-19 in Liberia, a country that's not experiencing as widespread direct impact as many uh, of the countries in the Northern Hemisphere, um, that the disruption is as extensive now as was during the height of the Ebola crisis. Some of the specific uh, context specific items that we noted were travel restrictions had limited NGO access to affected parts of Syria and Yemen. And when the travel restrictions were lifted, there were additional levels of approval required. International staff were repatriated from Bangladesh and it was more difficult to recruit behind them. There've been widespread disruption in international supply chains and even for some commodities that you wouldn't expect. For example, the global supply of malaria rapid diagnostic tests has been compromised by the fact that many manufacturers are turning their attention to developing antigen tests for COVID-19. There's been diversion of staff and supplies to support the response. And a chilling example was USAID's move uh, earlier this year to redirect PPE supplies uh, and restrict their purchase in order to conserve those for our domestic response here in the US. In many places, displaced persons have been excluded from income support, housing, and uh, 
other measures implemented to offset the impact of COVID-19 mitigation strategies. And there have been food distribution delays in a number of places, including northern Nigeria. I know that Ala Alt Tabawi and Mohammed Ahmad are going to present us some, some much more rich descriptions of the situation in Jordan and Pakistan. And finally, we focus on strategies that have been implemented to prevent and mitigate some of these indirect health impacts. We've grouped them into several themes. The first is to implement COVID-19 mitigation strategies and interventions in a do no harm approach, making sure that uh, measures taken to prevent COVID-19 transmission don't have an outsized adverse effect uh, in terms of indirect health impacts. Including displaced populations in the pandemic response, including in decisions about how to implement different mitigation strategies and how to include them in some of the relief efforts. And ensuring that essential health services for displaced populations are maintained. Some of the innovations that we detail are in the realm of service delivery. Uh, some partners have leveraged innovative digital technologies. Uh, health workforce solutions, including different models of utilizing task sharing and capacity building for community health workers, other lay providers, and informal caregivers. Uh, also efforts to facilitate the movement of uh, humanitarian staff, both within country and internationally. Ensuring access to essential medicines and supplies, adapting health information systems, innovative health financing approaches, and improved leadership and governance. And finally, I wanna thank the institutional partners and all of the individuals at the institutions who contributed to the writing committee. Uh, the Knowledge Brief really was a very timely opportunity to bring our expertise together on an issue that we didn't anticipate when we set out to, uh, to undertake this work for the World Bank. Some of the key takeaways that I'd like to leave you with are that there is urgent need for attention and advocacy around the, the indirect effects of COVID-19 and particularly around the, the way that they can impact uh, people in displacement situations. That anticipating the indirect effects is a key step to being able to mitigate them. And that our pandemic response efforts should consider a balance between the indirect health effects and the potential gain that can be made against the COVID-19 epidemic in a do no harm approach as described earlier. And then finally, I wanna, wanna um, emphasize that I took away a message of hope from this exercise, that not all of the past lessons and not all of the current experience is grim. There are concrete steps that partners are taking to mitigate against COVID-19, as well as overcome some of the potential adverse indirect health effects. So with that, thank you very much. Wonderful, thanks so much, Patrick. Um, it's certainly given us a good foundation to go to our next speaker. Um, over to you, Les. Hi, folks. Well, Patrick, thanks for that great overview of the report. As, as Patrick mentioned, the next two speakers are gonna give examples of the indirect effects they're seeing from COVID right now in the field. And I've had the odd luck of being maybe in 10 or 12 places where big outbreaks, let's say big means 500 deaths occurred. And therefore I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about what we've seen in past outbreaks and the patterns that have arisen. And my odd luck began in 1991 when I was doing a dissertation in Peru and the worst cholera outbreak to hit the Americas anywhere in the last hundred years 
struck 400,000 cases, 3,000 deaths. It was like the topic on the news every day for months and months, just like we're seeing with COVID. But what, what just astonished me and everyone was at the end, when people looked, they realized that more children had died from common diarrheas than had people died of cholera. In fact, more excess deaths above the normal in children had died from diarrhea than had people died of cholera. And the numbers of children that were showing up to health posts and health clinics had gone way, way down. The community health workers who were very sophisticated and networked in Peru were obsessed and had completely focused on cholera. And so in retrospect, it's not so surprising, but actually what I saw in Peru has like evolved to be a pattern that's happened almost every time I've been in a big outbreak. And so I'd like to sort of summarize three common themes that we seem to see in outbreaks again and again and again. One is that the most common causes of death get neglected and thus we get more deaths from them. The second is that these decreases in healthcare that Patrick talked about are two directional. They're from the health system being occupied and from people being less willing to go get health care. And that finally, fear and stigma almost always result in negative health effects. So aside from the Peruvian example I gave and Patrick highlighted in box number one highlighted how Ebola induced extra deaths in West Africa in 2014 and 2015. Uh, this process has, has happened again and again, including, for example, recently in North Kivu, we've had almost two years continuously of Ebola, but following about six months behind the rise of Ebola has been a rise of measles. WHO reports 50,000 excess deaths from measles. MSF thinks it's more like 200,000. That means that the probably disruptions of vaccination and healthcare in that region from Ebola have very likely caused more measles deaths than they've caused Ebola deaths. And that is just so both fascinating and common. And, you know, these disruptions are sometimes mostly on the patient side. When the US invaded Iraq, a really wealthy country with an incredibly sophisticated high functioning health system, the fraction of births that women started giving at home skyrocketed. So there's an example where it's the people staying home and not seeking out care. Most of you won't remember this, but back 20 years ago when we had polio eradication days, there were many countries like Mexico and Congo where when there would be these, these polio eradication days, the cause of the, pardon me, the numbers of deaths in the country would go way up for those days because the health system was being neglected. Where I worked in Congo at the time, those health workers at health clinics would earn more money in three days of polio eradication than they would earn in a month. So of course they were gonna neglect their job and clinics were gonna become lower functioning. But usually it's not one way or the other. Usually as described in Sierra Leone, and my example of Peru, usually it's two directional. In the 1990s, there was 20,000 hospitalized cases of cholera in the country of Malawi at a time when only one in eight people were refugees from Mozambique. It turns out 90% of the people hospitalized for cholera were, for re were refugees. Thinking about that epidemiologically, that means the odds ratio of being a cholera case, given that you're a refugee, is like a hundredfold higher. And we see this again and again and again that the most vulnerable people, the people that don't have social assets, the people that don't have transport assets, get affected the worst in these outbreaks. The most dramatic example I can think of is this was not an outbreak, except maybe an outbreak of stupidity or political violence. In 2005, a large number of people in the slums voted against Robert Mugabe. And so afterwards, he undertook this procedure referred to as Operation Marambachina, in which he, in those slums that had voted against him, enforced every imaginable little law and forced 
thousands of people to destroy their homes because they didn't have any proof that they uh, owned the land. They enforced every picayune little law, so public transport stopped going to these clinics. And mortality in those slums in the year that followed went up by 60%. And the main mechanism was because people went off their antiretrovirals. Wow, what a just astonishing notion that there are free antiretrovirals 20 kilometers away, but thousands of people couldn't go to get them, resulting in their death. That is sort of just highlighting how the vulnerables in emergencies get even more vulnerable. And you know, most outbreaks create stigma. In some, it's worse than others. During Ebola, it was really severe. And the fear of going to clinics because clinics were where Ebola cases were is part of what, was, what Patrick was describing in that, that study he described. But also another element was the government undertook quarantine if multiple cases in most uh, districts arose in the same village. And so chiefs, <clears throat> even though they had to by law report every death, were actively hiding deaths. And when we went out, I was working for WHO at the time in Sierra Leone, two thirds of all cases and deaths were never detected by the surveillance system, never went to a clinic. When MSF did a similar assessment in Liberia, they found the same thing because stigma had caused people to hide cases and in hiding cases to not seek care. We've got these three themes, the common causes get neglected, that it's the most vulnerable who get affected, and that stigma and shame and fear always induce things a little worse. And it appears so incredibly consistently that it will not surprise us that we're probably about to hear the same things arising with COVID. And I look forward to hearing that. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Uh, always so clear and, and, and powerful. So yes, let's move straight away to Ala. And Ala, perhaps you could, um, I know you're going to share your screen. Tell us a little bit how this is playing out uh, in the context of Jordan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this interesting event. Uh, so I will start to represent uh, IRC Jordan Health Response, uh, especially in COVID. Uh, as a brief, I would like, first of all, to give you uh, a basic information uh, about the current situation of uh, Jordan. So uh, Jordan, is hosting uh, around 1 million Syrian refugees. 20% uh, 20, 20 of them live inside the camp, which are Azraq and Zatari camp. And uh, as uh, we are, as IRC, we are providing uh, primary healthcare services, uh, which include non-communicable disease and sexual reproductive health, in addition to have uh, integrated community-based health uh, and uh, ECD through home visits. So uh, IRC uh, has providing the essential health services starting from June 2012, and uh, it has been providing over 500,000 uh, primary healthcare consultation, in addition to uh, more than 100,000 home visits. So um, briefing you on the current situation of COVID-19 in Jordan, so in the beginning, the uh, COVID outbreak was uh, very controlled and calm uh, comparing to other uh, countries. However, uh, in the mid of September, as we can see from this slide, uh, we noticed a huge uh, and unexpected increase in the number of COVID cases. So in one day in October, we have more than 4,000 uh, positive cases uh, of uh, COVID. Uh, accordingly, the, the, uh, the uh, government of Jordan decided to go back to some uh, restrictions, like having a national uh, lockdown on certain day, uh, movement restriction in certain governorates or uh, sometimes in, uh, in the camps. 
Um, here are the numbers of the cases that we had uh, already uh, and how many uh, around 2000 now under treatment, about more than 1000 uh, died, unfortunately. So uh, giving you a response, um, I will brief you about the response of IRC in Jordan office. So uh, IRC uh, uh, adapt its program very quickly uh, in order to make sure that we maintain the minimum health services to the beneficiaries. So the first uh, uh, and the number one priority for IRC in order to continue the uh, service uh, we make our safety, uh, our staff safety, and as well as beneficiary number one priority. And uh, as you know, if we don't make sure uh, this in place, we will not be able to continue our business uh, uh, for, uh, continuity of program. So uh, by provision of the BBE, uh, having them uh, with a good quality, and in addition, uh, providing uh, a standard infection prevention and control uh, uh, precautions. Uh, as well, uh, we make sure that each clinic has a triage and screening area, as well as isolation area for any suspected case. Uh, also, we have a policy uh, to make sure that in the, each, uh, uh, any suspected individual can, uh, can we have uh, uh, contact tracing, uh, contact tracing. On the other hand, uh, IRC uh, developed a remote management approach by utilizing technology. Uh, this is to ensure uh, continuity of the program. Uh, however, uh, this will be uh, done uh, with, ha with having a strengthening health system, uh, like having adaptable health information system, availability of the phone and internet with the staff, activating the appointment system of the beneficiary, and developing a volunteer management plan to ensure management, uh, good management of the COVID response. And uh, as uh, we already have mentioned that during the COVID uh, pandemic or out of outbreak, we try to maintain the minimum uh, service. And sometimes uh, we uh, try, to, I mean, we cancel some non-urgent services. So it depends on the epidemiological situation. Uh, the third response plan that IRC adapted is uh, the coordination of IRC with other stakeholders like the government and other humanitarian organization to ensure that we passing and sharing the uh, essential information and listen learn to make sure that uh, there is a well coordinated response between all stakeholders. Uh, uh, in addition, we have uh, to ensure uh, gender equality that integrated within uh, our response, especially highlighting the needs of women and girls, uh, uh, which is one, number one priority in IRC. On the other hand, uh, we uh, activate the communities by ensuring a good communications uh, channel between the beneficiaries uh, through uh, texting uh, appropriate messaging regarding uh, COVID, like ha uh, uh, hand washing, physical distancing, uh, physical distancing, self isolation. Uh, a brief about how we did uh, the delivery of uh, remote management uh, model in our clinics. So first of all, we retrieve the data from the health information system, which contains all the patient information from the previous medical history, the medications, the personal uh, uh, information, phone numbers. Uh, then we prepare the patient list, which uh, contains around, uh, on average, 25 to 35 patients on daily basis. And this list uh, will be shared with the nurse to, to do a free consultation or a screening questions to make sure that uh, it will be uh, uh, aware of uh, the procedure that we are going through it. And we will for sure uh, give, her, uh, give them a special uh, lifestyle modification. Then the process goes to the medical doctor where a virtual clinic or online consultation given by the medical doctors. If the doctor finds the patient is stable, uh, whether it's a uh, diabetic or hypertensive uh, patient, the, uh, prescription will, the prescription will be written online and it will be shared with the contracted pharmacy uh, uh, with the, our essential drug list, according to our essential drug list. Uh, then the, during, out, uh, during the outbreak uh, or during the essential, uh, uh, the first time of the lockdown, uh, the contracted pharmacy delivered the medication to the household of the patient 
uh, during the, incomplete, the complete lockdown. However, in the camps, uh, we count on the support of volunteers in delivery of medication. The last step, we receive uh, the feedback about the whole process uh, by uh, utilizing the accountability system and team. Uh, this is to make sure that we are providing quality service. So the objective of this presentation or event is to highlight about the short term and the long term of indirect impact, uh, impact of uh, the health services. So starting from the sexual reproductive health, we noticed there are reduced number of consultation due to social distancing and uh, due to the uh, fear from uh, uh, the beneficiaries. However, we lose the chance of identifying the early detection of high-risk pregnancy in the beginning of the uh, our lockdown in camps and the urban. And accordingly, uh, because we suspended uh, the uh, reproductive health awareness session due to uh, the urgency to stick with the social distancing, all of this will uh, lead to uh, long-term impact, uh, which uh, may lead in future to have uh, any planned pregnancy and uh, in the, uh, on the long term, it might lead to increased mortality uh, of uh, the mother or uh, the child. On the other hand, we uh, stopped completely the vaccination service from the beginning of the crisis for more than two months in CAM and uh, urban. So no more uh, TT vaccine given to the women and girls and no more uh, vaccines given to the uh, children and infants according to the customized, customized age group. Uh, so as I mentioned here that we might notice in the future maternal complications and uh, maternal or neonatal mortality uh, due to any planned uh, pregnancy. Uh, and this is because, uh, let's say, to talk about the urban, uh, uh, urban uh, the antenatal and postnatal were missed due to remote management. And according uh, to the remote management, we were not able to provide certain family planning methods like IUD, Implanon, Deep or Prevora. Uh, However, we uh, focused on providing uh, uh, certain uh, family planning methods like condom and pills through our contracted pharmacy. Uh, moreover, we cannot be able uh, to provide uh, or to have uh, an idea about the level of uh, hemoglobin, blood pressure reading, blood glucose, uh, and we are not able to register new cases uh, because we have to know the previous history of uh, the patient. Uh, in addition, we suspended in the beginning of the lo uh, lockdown uh, certain referral cases because it was beyond the functional capacity of the uh, health system. Uh, uh, and in the beginning also of the lockdown, uh, there was a suspending of the uh, management of immediate consequences of sexual violence and clinical management uh, of rape. Uh, looking at non-communicable disease, we noticed that also the number of con consultation has been decreased about 30% uh, because the visit, uh, uh, because we link to the MOH reg regulation and we make the visit to be once every three months. Uh, in addition, uh, it was hard to, uh, to detect early the highly risky group of non-communicable disease. Uh, in addition, also, we noticed that the patient was uh, not committed to use of a drug because uh, they are not committed to uh, health education uh, through online uh, um, awareness. Uh, focusing more, uh, more on urban, we noticed uh, because, as I mentioned, we prescribe medication once time for three months for diabetes and hypertension uh, for life-saving. Uh, and because, uh, as everyone knows, there is no physical examination and most of the consultation, uh, not most, all of the consultation were done uh, through the uh, phone and remote management, so uh, no regular reading for blood pressure and glucose, uh, and the early detection of highly risk group, will, it was be a challenge. Uh, so, uh, in addition, it was uh, uh, challenging in uh, delivering the medication through the contracted uh, pharmacy during the uh, lockdown uh, because uh, the pharmacy itself uh, has uh, many logistic obstacles. Uh, we can't uh, forget the stressful situation of the diabetes and hypertensive patients uh, and the lifestyle, uh, life health style with, uh, with restricted movement uh, and the inability um, uh, to have physical uh, activity. Uh, so, in addition, uh, uh, 
uh, there are a lot of services that canceled, like um, uh, preventive services as cancer screening and treatment has been uh, suspended uh, and affected during the, uh, the lockdown. Um, looking at the communicable uh, disease patient, we also noticed the number of consultations reduced by 50% due to strict IPC measures and the fear of the uh, um, beneficiaries. Uh, so in a nutshell, we can see that there are three components highly affected during the lockdown uh, as a response of COVID. Uh, the first one is accessibility. Uh, it is a big challenge for the urban, uh, for the beneficiaries who live in the urban to accessible uh, to the health service. To the affordability, affordability also it's a challenge because it's not free of charge. However, IRC is providing free of charge uh, uh, medical consultation and medication, and uh, as well as uh, the quality of the service. Moving to uh, the COVID, uh, the effect of COVID on uh, community health. Uh, also, we suspended the, the home visit uh, uh, that uh, provided uh, the activities and we stop uh, screening the non-communicable disease com uh, complication uh, through the uh, monthly home visit, like diabetic, uh, food edema, uh, the, uh, uh, screening for uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension. So in this uh, uh, suspension, we cannot uh, really have an idea about the quality and the health status of the patient. Uh, also, uh, we stop uh, the home visit um, uh, uh, that uh, highlighting the education of patients on self-care uh, management. Uh, as well as there is a big impact on the community health volunteers that integrated with the ECD services. So we uh, make redeveloping of the health messages on the ECD activities and retrain the community health volunteers on a new remote uh, service delivery model. Uh, and we use the phone-based module, which was uh, around 20 minutes phone call. Uh, we also are turning to remote education, which increased the load on the families and increased the efforts on uh, the community, uh, community health volunteers uh, themselves, uh, as well as there is uh, many logistic obstacles uh, was faced during uh, this management of integration uh, of community health volunteers with the ECD. Uh, lastly, I can mention that we have noticed increased number of dem domestic violence, uh, especially against women and children, and uh, the IRC uh, provide uh, remote management of uh, gender-based violence uh, response uh, and uh, prevention in order to ensure access um, uh, to this service. Uh, and uh, also we provide remote awareness sessions uh, highlighting the GBV basic uh, issues and legal counseling. So this is in a brief uh, and a, on a quick brief uh, about what we, uh, we did uh, from the uh, beginning of the COVID till, uh, till now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ala, and uh, sorry to keep waving my little red flags at you, but uh, I did want to make sure we had enough time for Mohammed and also for some questions which are already coming in. So Mohammed, uh, over to you. If, you. if you could keep it to seven minutes, it would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll try my best. And uh, thank you. Uh, for giving us an opportunity to reflect upon the problem our refugees are facing. Uh, you all might know that Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan, we have 1.4 million Afghan refugees since long, and these are the document caseload. Uh, we have an additional uh, <clears throat> caseload of undocumented Afghan refugees in Pakistan. And, we all know that uh, the refugees are mostly in the low income and our middle income countries, the 80%. So uh, the health services are not an ideal uh, situation for the host community, even uh, when uh, this pandemic hit, uh, we were, everybody was uh, in a surprise and so is the case with the help uh, provider with the service provider and uh, with the community as well. So uh, there was a disruption of the OPD services and uh, there were 
like uh, availability of health services were was discontinued though it was not an ideal situation uh, for the refugees uh, we have some basic health unit in the refugees villages but for secondary and tertiary uh, health care uh, they were they have been facing problem in accessing health services the second thing is affordability if uh, they have uh, the, the public health sector was overburdened and uh, they, they, uh, the, the refugees were not uh, a priority for them. Uh, the private health sector is costly and we all know that the COVID situation disrupted their uh, uh, livelihood sources. Mostly they are daily wages, are uh, having small shops. Uh, and those were closed down by the COVID and the livelihood, the disruption of their livelihood sources uh, lead to erode their uh, asset base in, for, for the survival. So that create another problem of mental health. Uh, so what to talk of uh, availing the private health services? So coupled with the economic situation, uh, we witnessed that uh, they were the most vulnerable uh, segment in the society or in the host countries. Uh, thirdly, as uh, mentioned by the earlier respected colleague, mobility was an issue. Uh, the, the, the regular transport was disrupted. Usually, uh, the, the refugees are living in the border areas, are around the border areas, and mostly in the rural settings. Uh, so, mobility was also an issue. And secondly, their documentation, because they have, uh, most of them don't have the regular documentation. Thirdly, they are not under the national protection or the uh, social safety nets they are not covered in there. So, uh, so to say that they were in trouble uh, and they are in trouble uh, right now, especially the old age people and uh, the, 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 the mother and child. Uh, what we did, uh, we, we tried uh, to strengthen the health facilities around uh, we started uh, training the, the, the paramedics within the community. We restart the education so that we can communicate messages to the children and to uh, their families. We train teachers for them. We uh, start supporting uh, their livelihood sources and uh, opened up uh, shops and some whatever they were doing, so we start supporting so that they can start their livelihood. The third, uh, fourthly, we uh, translate messages uh, for the risk communication in their native languages like over here, mostly they are speaking Pushto and uh, Persian, so Ardari. So uh, the language is other than the uh, host uh, country language. So we start translating messages for them. Uh, now, uh, a lot of things need to be done. Uh, there should be more, more investment on the healthcare, especially for the refugees and displaced people because they are the least, uh, least priority. Uh, and for that matter, we in Pakistan prioritize refugees in our uh, uh, humanitarian response plan. Secondly, the, this response should be coupled with the health response should be coupled with the protection, education and livelihood sources support uh, for the refugees and the displaced people. Uh, so in Pakistan right now, uh, we are in a process to, uh, because there is uh, a second wave on the, uh, on the card, so we prioritize refugees and displaced population 
for uh, HRP for uh, or HRP for 2021 and our organizations they are doing whatever they can do uh, secondly our government uh, they start a social safety program for the refugees uh, supported by UNHCR and some of the donors uh, but much more needed to be done uh the situation is new for all of us uh in the start we were confused but now at least we are a bit clear on our approaches uh for what to do if there will be a second spell of the covid 19 in the coming month so uh, a more systematic uh, a more scientific uh, scientific approaches are needed for uh, especially uh, to to uh, to take care of the refugees and displaced population uh, in our countries. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, both both you and Allah really added, I think, um, just such a sort of rich um, perspective on how these issues are playing out and, and what you're actually doing uh, in terms of strategies to anticipate and, uh, and, and respond to the potential indirect impact. So thank you for all of our, to all of our panelists. Um, we already have quite a few questions in the Q&A box. Please do keep them coming in. Um, but for our panelists, I'm gonna pool a few questions for you. Uh, so we'll take a cluster of four or five, respond, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to come back for another round. Um, so in terms of some of the questions that we've re been receiving, uh, we received, uh, I think, an important question from Alistair Ager, um, who thanks uh, the report writers uh, for looking at the indirect health impacts, but really asks how the evidence um, around indirect health impacts influences actors beyond the health sector, given the disruption on food security, livelihoods and so much. So I think Mohammed and Allah have begun to take us in that direction, but it would be great uh, for our panelists to, to consider that question. We also had, I think, an interesting question come in from Nicholas Markashvili. Um, I'm gonna pull one of them, Nicholas, and he asks for, one or two practical examples uh, of ways in which displaced populations have been involved in the uh, decision-making uh, and uh, process of putting in place uh, mitigation strategies around health. Um, and then we had two specific questions for Ala. Um, Ala, one of these questions comes from uh, Paolo Verme. Uh, at the World Bank, and he asks you whether there are any, whether you have any insights into the spread of COVID-19, um, both in the camps um, and in uh, urban settings, um, and uh, let me see, uh, and what the uh, different policy responses in each have been. Um, and then finally, there was a question here that I saw, and our Q&A box has gone wild, but there is a a question here that relates to NCDs as well in Jordan, um, and really looking at this question of um, how the refugee situation might differ from the local population um, uh, in terms of access to uh, uh, management around NCD complications. Um, so two questions specifically for Allah, but I think I'm going to start uh, with that question that Alistair posed, uh, you know, what are the implications more broadly uh, outside of the health sector that we should be considering? Um, and then move to this question of uh, how have we integrated the voice of uh, refugee populations? Who'd like to go first? Les, how about I call on you um, and then we can, we can kick off. So, uh... I'm working on a project with the CDC and IRC that's been monitoring the same 450 households for more than two years now. COVID has come along. There has been no health effects from COVID, and yet the economy has collapsed. People tell us there's food shortages. The level of violence is way up. 
So Alistair's question is a great question, but there's sort of two parts to it. What's the importance of all the other sectors? In CAR, right now, COVID has induced violence, and violence is inducing a lot of health effects. The separate part is what should we do about it? You know, we in the humanitarian community, we are bad at preventing violence. Right? There's certain things we can do, like vaccinate when we have a vaccine. There's certain things we don't do very well. And, and I think we just need to struggle and then be articulating in many places, food shortages are gonna be the main effect of COVID. In other places, violence is gonna be the main effect of COVID. And it is more our role with our health partners to be articulating that to the world than it is to go out and try to stop those rebels from shooting their neighbors, would be my simplistic answer. Thank you, Les. Patrick. I was, I think that was a brilliant answer. And I was just going to add that I think uh, from New York, um, our, our uh, ability uh, to advocate and uh, remind people that these adverse health consequences come about not just because health facilities are closed or health workers are sick, but also because of economic, legal, security, all sorts of cross-sectoral issues. Uh, and so as health people, it's our obligation not just to advocate for the health solutions to health problems, but also to draw attention to the multi-sectoral uh, uh, factors that influence them. Thanks, Patrick. Mohammed, I'm going to come to you on uh, some examples of how uh, refugees have been involved in some of the strategizing and programming around how to respond uh, to the pandemic. Do you have any um, examples you would like to share? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, to some extent. Uh, first, I'll uh, try to answer. Uh, the f first part, uh, we are running uh, schools for uh, 16,000 uh, students and we have community teachers and they are supported, their salaries were supported from the community through feces. So when uh, this pen uh, the schools uh, got closed, so they, lo uh, they lost uh, their jobs. Uh, the same is the case with the daily wager and with the shopkeepers. And when we uh, done a survey, so uh, mostly the people who had poultry or livestock, they used it for their daily consumption during this period of like their little period. So uh, before uh, the live, uh, livestock were source of their uh, livelihood. So these were some of them. Uh, what we did, we have already uh, uh, had a refugees council for our activities. So we call it Shura in Pashto. Uh, Shura means council or jarga. So uh, we are working uh, for the refugees, through the refugees, and they are involved. Uh, th those councils are involved in the decision making to some extent. Uh, I don't say that uh, this is an ideal situation. I hope today uh, we have uh, some refugees uh, as well, but uh, to represent their case. Uh, but to a great extent, we tried because uh, the, uh, the refugees caseload is the oldest caseload uh, in Pakistan. It's like four decades now. Uh, so we have uh, some uh, communities uh, setups for decision making and for implementing the projects and uh, especially for health and education. So we involve them to, a, some, to some extent. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mohammed. So Hala, I'm gonna to come to you for the last two specific questions. Um, one about the spread of COVID-19 in camps versus urban and the different policy responses and then um, you know, the impact on host versus local uh, of, for example, NCD management and access to NCD care. Thank you, Zawd. 
uh, actually, when we look at the CAM, it's much more controlled uh, comparing to the urban uh, because uh, the government can control more uh, certain areas in the uh, CAM, and we also have limited number of population in the CAM, so it's much more controlled. And they have the accessibility for any kind of health service free of charge, so there is no challenge at the level of the CAM. However, uh, in the CAM, we provide two uh, type of service health modality. Uh, the first one is direct provision, uh, which is limited to the uh, essential health services. And the second one, uh, uh, remote management, uh, to ensure that uh, like uh, medication of chronic uh, health diseases can be delivered to the patient's household to ensure they are not coming to the clinic and to maintain their safety. So in the camp, it's very much controlled. However, the challenge we are facing uh, right now is at the level of the urban because we have, um, uh, they are distributed on many uh, governorates. Uh, when they are asking for certain kind of health service, they have to pay like non-insured health uh, Jordanian. And some of the Syrian refugees, they are not affordable to pay such, um, um, such fees, uh, though it's very, very little. Uh, and especially as, as you know, uh, due to this current uh, pandemic, most of the people uh, lost their job. So uh, they have a problem of accessibility, they have a problem of affordability, and also if they can afford in some cases uh, uh, the health service they wanted, uh, the quality is still uh, a questionable for us because the health system in Jordan is overstretched uh, because of COVID and because of many health um, uh, concerns that they are following on it. This is for the first question. The second is explain the situation in Jordan and the idea in terms of access to life-saving emergencies, especially around management of non-communicable. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, part of my question that the refugees, they are accessible uh, to the emergency service because they uh, can call the civil defense and the civil de defense can reach to the, uh, their households. Uh, however, sometimes because as I mentioned, the health system is already overwhelmed. So um, sometimes maybe there is uh, uh, a long time to wait for having such uh, uh, supporting or for emergency response. So it will be a challenging actually for even for the local community. It's not only just for refugees. So uh, both the local community and uh, as uh, and the refugees, this. Uh, already have such kind the same challenge regarding having accessible to the uh, emergency service. Right. Thank you, Hala. So we have one uh, question that's come in from one of our students now, Haba, um, relating to um, you know, the, the challenges that uh, you alluded to, Hala, in your presentation around providing telemedicine through phone or internet. But what I would like to do, I mean, obviously I'd like you to, to reflect on that, Ala, because you pointed to some challenges. I'd like to open up that question to the panel as a whole to really re reflect on, on the role of technology in this space. I mean, we, we often think about technology as one of the ways, particularly telemedicine, uh, as being you know, um, a really productive way in which a new tool perhaps to address these indirect health impacts and ensure continuity of care and I, I would be interested in your perspectives as a panel uh, on what the, the pros and cons of technology might be in this space, either with respect to telemedicine or even more broadly. Um, and a call to, to the audience. Perhaps you have one more round of questions before we close. So do, do put your questions in the chat box. So um, Ala, perhaps could we start with you? Um, what were some of the challenges you were alluding to in Jordan? And for the rest of you, please be thinking about that bigger question that I posed. Uh, yeah, uh, really this is a very important question because uh, maybe uh, you can realize from the way that I expressed the response of IRC, it's not an easy way of uh, adaptation, especially when we are dealing with the uh, uh, utilization of uh, technology. So in the beginning, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have to ensure that each organization has uh, adaptable health information system. This is the first uh, point and the first challenge, not 
each organization had such kind of uh, adapting health information system. So because we were able to make it uh, accessible uh, to the um, uh, to the staff themselves in their home, this is number one. It's a big challenge for us. Number two, that uh, availability of internet uh, within uh, uh, the staff and the volunteers. Sometimes the volunteers and even sometimes the beneficiaries they don't afford to pay. Uh, uh, for the internet or they don't have a smartphone. So sometimes this is a challenge for us. Uh, even um, I can say that um, uh, in the beginning, we touched some of uh, resistance from some uh, beneficiaries because uh, they don't understand what is telecommunication or telemedicine. Uh, they are afraid that they, uh, we, uh, they don't have a privacy. Uh, they're afraid that someone else can share the uh, patient file with uh, some, uh, another person. So this is also uh, uh, was in the beginning like an issue that we uh, deal with it with the beneficiary. So here are the main things that uh, we should make sure the availability of adaptable health information system, uh, affordable uh, technology with the staff and the volunteer and the beneficiaries and ensuring the privacy of the beneficiary uh, uh, and the continuity of uh, quality of service because you know having such modality uh, it means that we make it virtual and we are not able to have blood pressure uh, uh, reading or diabetes and most of the beneficiaries they don't have devices at their home so we're providing the service and the consultation and we uh, put a lot of uh, screening questions to make sure that there is no uh, high risk uh, patient. However, it is a uh, challenging for us because uh, uh, it's a tool that it should not it should not reflect 100% uh, the situation of the patient. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Ala. Um, so, uh, Mohammed, do you have any reflections yourself on this question and how technology has been used in the context of Pakistan? Uh, yes, we have somehow the same experience because we wanted to use uh, technologies, technology for education um, because in this very period, uh, like there were uh, online classes uh, around, uh, around the world. But the same problem we faced that the refugees, they didn't have the uh, uh, technology uh, uh, facilities like um, especially internet or uh, uh, this uh, touch mobile or cellular or uh, laptop. So uh, we couldn't start that. Uh, we, we wanted to train even the teachers through uh, IT, but uh, we couldn't do it because uh, the worst case is uh, in most of the camps or refugees villages, there was a, a problem of electricity even. So uh, this was a, uh, a bottleneck. Uh, health uh, uh, services through IT is more a technical job then. You need to uh, have uh, an educated person on the uh, other side as well to check the temperature or blood pressure or uh, uh, the rest. So uh, we failed to apply technology. Now, uh, when our schools are, have been started and now we are in the community, so now we, are, we, are, we have started uh, IT education for the teachers uh, and for the student uh, so that we can prepare them for the future. <coughs> Previously, we were badly failing this. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, some healthy perspective here on, on how technology is or is not useful in these contexts. So to Patrick and Les, any, any sort of mm -hmm. final thoughts drawing on what you've heard on this specific question? I think in some places where the technology has been more broadly available, that the pandemic has unleashed the potential of telemedicine that was perhaps unrealized uh, beforehand, and uh, that has been remarkable to observe. But I, I, I am concerned that uh, 
it's sometimes writ large as a solution across all contexts. And of course it isn't. Of course, the, the displaced populations that, and vulnerable populations that we're most concerned about are gonna be the last people to have access to technology. So maybe think about what's telemedicine trying to accomplish. It's trying to reach beyond the walls of the physical uh, health clinic. Uh, and so, looking at other strategies in terms of outreach or uh, you know providing services at the doorstep uh, where an individual health worker or team can manage their own exposure and protect the the clients uh, as well or managing uh, to uh, push out things like prescription renewals, which needn't necessarily always involve a face-to-face -face contact. Um, so a number of, of ways just to think differently about uh, how to overcome some of the uh, some of the barriers that coming to the health facility represents for those conditions for which it's possible, and then finding other ways of uh, of maintaining services that need to be provided in person. Thanks, Patrick. Les, do you have anything to add there? I just completely agree with what Patrick said. And, and you know, there are a billion people who are below the World Bank poverty rate of $1.90 per day. So what Mohammed described as like technology may be driving the inequities, I see that in my wealthy American country when kids have to go online to go to school, the poorest kids are getting like worse education and the richest are getting better. And I just can't imagine what Mohammed is experiencing in Pakistan with that phenomena. So I just think we need to be cautious. Great tool for helping surgeons look at a patient and get advice. Bad tool for social justice in a poor place. Goodness, well, what, what, um, what a way to, I think, draw us to a close. We um, have just a couple of minutes left um, and I'm going to use them to uh, thank our panelists. I'm conscious we have a couple of great questions that came in on the Q&A. Rest assured, uh, audience, we'll make sure we get you a response, but it might have to be a written response. Um, so I'd like to uh, really extend, uh, you know, uh, real gratitude to Ala, to Mohammed, to uh, Les and Patrick for uh, walking us through this this complex topic, but in in very uh, sort of digestible and real world terms. And uh, I think um, you know we we um, we've learned a lot from this panel. And I think as the pandemic unfolds, uh, you know, humanitarian practice is definitely going to be challenged perhaps in ways unanticipated, um, but there, has, there is a lot that we can learn from, from our past experiences and what, from what you're already, I think, trying to innovate at the field level in the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Um, Jing, could I ask you to share the screen? Um, I'm very excited to say that while we've been on this webinar, the knowledge brief itself has gone live. Uh, and so there is a link here um, for audience members to, uh, to access the knowledge brief as a whole. Um, please do so. Please share it with your uh, constituencies and networks. And um, thank you again to uh, all of the consortium members who worked with us to put this together at AUB, Los Andes, Brandeis, and Georgetown. Um, thank you to ICVA for co-hosting this with us. And thank you to you, our audience, for really um, generating such an interesting set of questions and for um, you know, sharing, sharing in this release moment with us. Thank you all. And um, until the next time, until the next Knowledge Brief. Bye-bye, everyone. Shokran, thank you. Bye. Thanks.